This week we're celebrating the new feminist western, The Drover's Wife, The Legend of Molly Johnson. It's the first Australian feature film with an Indigenous woman writing, directing and performing the lead role. Here's the amazing Leah Purcell. As an Indigenous woman, our stories are all that we have left and it's it's for us to tell these stories. So we're sharing in a dreaming. We call it our dreaming. You and I are sharing a dreaming right now. We're taking time and we're sharing time and we're in this moment. So my gift to my Australian audience, to my global audience, especially the Brits, this is our shared history. I also chat to actor and director Kerry Fox to get her response to this powerful film. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Hello and welcome to Girls on Film. I'm Anna Smith. And this episode is in partnership with Modern Films, who are releasing The Drover's Wife, The Legend of Molly Johnson, in UK cinemas on May 13th, 2022. I love watching my Joe cantering across the flats. Sun setting behind him, children running to greet him. Waving his hat with joy on seeing them. He's been away three months. Mrs. Joe Johnson. I'm worried about her. She's alone. Molly Johnson grew up out here. She knows the way. I'm just a drover's wife. Cross me and I'll kill you. I'll shoot you where you stand and I'll bury you where you fall. (laughs) The film is written, directed by and stars Leah Purcell, who'd be well known to you if you're listening in Australia. As well as being a great director, Leah has appeared in some of my favourite Australian films, including Lantana, Somersault and The Proposition. The Drover's Wife turns the traditional Western film genre on its head with a powerful female narrative and also one that looks at Australia's indigenous heritage. My children need me. They need their mother. I love yous. Love you, Mama! Always with you. Welcome to Everton. Little more than you bargained for. Walking straight into a murder investigation. Six people dead. Probably a Narago man, sir. The film follows Leah's own theatre adaptation of the classic novel by Henry Lawson, which was published in 1892. Are you a bad man, then? I think I am. I'm delighted to welcome Leah to Girls on Film today. Thanks for having me. I loved the film. It's such a powerful piece of work and an extraordinary achievement. For the listeners who haven't seen it, I know this has been a part of your life for a long time, but how would you kind of summarise the film for them? Um, It's about a mother's love. It's about survival. It's about hope. And it's what a mother goes, the lengths a mother would go to to protect her children. This story, I reimagined it from one of our classic legendary poets, uh, Henry Lawson. The Drover's Wife is considered a short story. It's nine pages. It's an Australian classic. And it's about a drover's wife who's on the property. Her husband's away droving. That's, I guess that's like um, herding cattle or sheep, a shepherd. Someone sort of said that would be a good way to describe it for those who don't know what a drover is. But they're away at a lengthy time. And in Henry Lawson's story, it's about a black snake that's under her wood heap and it goes into the hut and she has to keep her children safe. And while she's waiting for the snake to come out, she thinks about all the hardships that she's gone through and how much she has to do for her children and herself on her own. But what I had done is reimagined Henry Lawson. So the basis is there, I guess, the the racism, the, the, the violence of the time, the um, gender inequality. And what I've also done is put my Indigenous heritage through. So instead of the black snake, I placed a black man. But instead of the black man being a stereotypical bad guy, I've made him the hero. Yaraka of the Guguyemera. It is you. Oh, word travels faster, Andy. State your business. A drive with Joe. So this drive he didn't show. First time in eight years. You're a good man. Come with me. Did you believe her, Molly Johnson? 
Her husband waving his hat and seeing the children. Somehow it didn't ring true. Our secret. And Molly Johnson, I gave her a name. Henry Lawson didn't give her one, but I gave her one. And she does. She has to fight. She has intruders that come to her property. There's a few little secrets that she's hiding and needs to stay hidden. And through the course of the film, they come out and she's got to do what she's got to do for her children to keep them safe. She's an incredible character and it's such a joy to see a woman like this on screen. As you say, she's incredibly strong and determined and capable, but as you say, gone through so much hardship. Too many whites, too many guns now. This land needs law. You dare look a white man in the eye, Jackie? Fight for my children, fight for my life, I will. Whilst hunting savages, please do not turn into one. It is you. I'm just a drover's wife. I believe you, you also played her on the stage, didn't you? This has been a long journey. Yeah, no, the idea, I actually first connected to this story as a five-year-old. And it was one of my mother's favourite stories. And she actually had the original book of Henry, well, not the original, but a, a, a book of his short stories. And um, she would read or recite The Drover's Wife to me. And I think it was the first time I used my imagination to connect to a story. And I was the little boy that was the drover's wife protector. I saw my mother as the drover's wife. I didn't have my white dad in my life. So it was, there was no male figure around. So my mother was the mother, the father, the man of the house. I was her protector, you know. So I connected there. And then in 2014, I was feeling the urge to write. And I said, it's time to grab that little book off the shelf. That was the only thing I took when my mother passed away. And I said, I'm going to write this play. And um, I think it came first as a play because I was involved with theatre at that time. And away I went. And I won the Balnais Fellowship, which allowed me to have finance to write and work very closely with our Belvoir Street Theatre in Sydney. And if the play turned out to be any good, we got a season at Belvoir, which we did. We only did 33 shows, but we sold out and uh, people are screaming for it to come back. Now that I've done like the films coming out, there was also a novel. And it's just something what me and my partner do, Bain Stewart, who's my partner in life and business and lead producer of the film. It's something that we do with our ideas. If we know that they're going to get bums on seats, audience engagement, we just milk it for all it's worth. So it's his idea coming up with novels and films. And apparently there's an opera. Someone's approached just about an opera. So there you go. Wow. <laughs> You both sound incredibly driven and determined. What's your secret? Have you always been that way, just really engaged and motivated? Yeah, I think we are. Like this industry can be quite lonely and um, it is just me and him and our production company and we're very lucky that I guess I've got the talent to continue my work load and be offered work. But we are driven people and I think that comes back to our Aboriginal mothers who never had voices who were a generation of lost people because they weren't allowed to practice their culture and traditions, but they didn't quite fit into white society. And myself and Bain are both at this stage where we can capitalise and, and make good and give voices to our mothers. And if we didn't actually work hard, strive to be the best that we can, put our Indigenous voices at the forefront, then it's a crime against our mothers and our grandmothers who have suffered. So that drives us to be the truth tellers of our Indigenous stories. Look, we love what we do, like what an industry. And we're very blessed that we are in this industry and people want to hear our stories. I've got a lovely fan base that's followed me. But we've been hustling for 30 years and there's a door that's open to us now. I don't think anyone's holding it open yet, but the door is there. It's an amazing achievement and I'm sure your mother would be so proud. Was there a moment when you were filming this that felt quite emotional because I understand you've weaved quite a lot of your own story in there. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. There was times where more so in the writing and then also in the editing because I wrote it, I star in it, I'm a director, I co-produced it, I did my own fight stunts. So on the day, you know, I just had to do those jobs. When I had my actor's hat on, I had to perform. Thank goodness I had the play behind me because that really sat Molly in my body and I didn't have to do too much thinking about what I had to do. If anything, just pull it back and be in the moment. So I just wanted to make sure 
that I'd done those jobs on the day, but it wasn't until you got to the edit where I could sit back and I had to sit back and it was sharing those moments, I guess, with other people that weren't aware of my journey or my family's plight because it is, my DNA runs very deep within the film and a lot of the stuff that I do in this stage of my career is I base things on my stories within my family, on fact. It's a strong foundation, a foundation of truth where I feel confident enough then to bring in fiction and create the characters and do all what you need to do to tick the box of the genre that we're trying to achieve with the film. Danny, gun. really interesting time in history um i mean you sort of mentioned sort of gender politics and so on towards the end of the film without spoilers there's a sense of women supporting women Mm. or the early stages of that where was the women's suffrage movement at that point in place and time what research did you uncover there was a movement just starting i really looked that up for in the novel there's more more about that in the novel with louisa and nate clintoff because they're not in the play i made them as a new character that sat in the film to bring my audience into Molly. And Louisa Clintoff in the film is also loosely based on Henry Lawson's mother, Louise Lawson, who was actually wrote a newspaper. She had a journal. It was for women's issues. She was a part of that movement, writing about about all of that. So I was influenced to bring Henry Lawson's mother through, through Louisa. And just with the, oh, I don't want to give too much away, but with the things that they do, I was influenced from the London as well, the British movement. But there were women of those times and Henry Lawson's mother was at the forefront of giving the voice to the female and getting things legislated like in you know battered wives was a big thing in those days as well. It's really fascinating I mean sort of broadening this out into what you might call the western genre how do you feel that women in particular have been underrepresented in that genre and is that something you feel needs to change? I mean, watching this film makes me think yes and yes. Yeah. Well, apart from Godless, which was another influence to me, which is a TV show, you know, the women in Westerns are being raped. They're being stolen. You know, they're lost to a First Nations American tribe and they're always the damsel in distress. Now, I grew up on Westerns because in my small country town, we only had two channels. So a Sunday matinee afternoon would be Cowboys and Indians with my mum. So I grew up on that. But But I chose the Western genre because I knew that I could be brutally honest in the brutality and really apply the history that came from my Aboriginal great-grandfather's diaries that were written about him. And, you know, wielding guns and shooting people as you do in Westerns, which allows the brutality to come through. But I do want my audiences to know I did do it tastefully. It's not there for the sake of. There, you know, there is a purpose behind it. And I think I've done it with care. Please, my children. Oh, 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 good God, a foot. There are moments where obviously there's something very painful is happening to Molly, but it's, yeah, it's it's handled, I thought, very responsibly and very well. Oh, thank you. As you suggest, I think, unfortunately, sometimes it's been handled very badly in Westerns and sensationalised and such like. Mm. Are there any other feminist aspects of the film? I mean, we've talked briefly about motherhood, but any themes that you'd like to discuss that, that were important to you? Oh, well, you know... Mother, mother's love, motherhood, um, the the generational care of women in in the film. It's 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 spoken about. Um, there's spirituality, and I guess the injustice, the injustice to Molly. There's an injustice that happens, but I love. There's an awesome scene between Louisa and Molly, and I love the way those two women banter to one another. So yes, it's a feminist movement, but they're also weighing each other up and I think it's a beautiful opportunity for women it's about listening listening to one another and 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 helping they're also you know especially if you look at it from an indigenous and white person's perspective I did that with Louisa because there are a lot of 
non-Indigenous people in, in Australia that want to find a way to help. But instead of they just sort of barrel through and think what they need to do could possibly be right without consultation with the Indigenous women or the Indigenous people and just sitting and listening and, and, and letting the Indigenous people lead, giving them that power. And that's what I wanted to portray with Molly and, and Louisa at that time. And that's one of my favourite scenes and I loved writing that. And I loved hearing Jess and, oh, that's me and myself, I was going to say, and Molly deliver it, but that's me. <laughs> <laughs> you must have felt like you were Molly sometimes. I mean, you've lived her and breathed her for such a long time. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Leah, what extra challenges did you have filming this rather than playing her on the stage? Yeah, look, of course, um, it was all shot on location. So, of course, Mother Nature, we had to be prepared for what she was going to throw at us. But I love challenges and I knew that I was open to receiving anything that Mother Nature was going to get. So we had ice, we had rain, we had 100 mile per hour winds, we had a really, really cold night. I think it got down to minus two. We had one of the young boys on that night and people said, what are we going to do? And I went, well, let's move that scene inside. When the wind came, I said, this is amazing. It looks like it's an $80 million film and I've got big electric fans making this look amazing. Amazing. I said, we're going to shoot this, you know. So if I was too rigid in what I needed from that scene, I think I would have stitched myself up. So I was really open to receiving. Other than the cold, I think there was a few nights where Rob Collins, who plays Yarika, the character that is based on my great grandfather, where he had to be in bare feet. So I was very conscious of what I was putting him through. And I think when I knew what I was doing that to my actors, that was more challenging for me because I just wanted to put him in Ugg boots and wrap him in a blanket and give him a water bottle. <laughs> About 10 days back now, Ma went to put the broom away. She hears this snorting and grunting. The others were out back playing. Ma goes to the door, cracks it open. There's this big bloody wild bullock. Horns the width of a grown man's arm span. <laughs> My brothers and sisters start to move around front. The bullock looks over at him. I give Ma the gun. She uses the door frame as her guide. <laughs> Show him straight between the eyes. What? What did you just say? How he shot the bullock straight between the eyes. Ma? Good night, son. Good night, Yoriko. Well, it's wonderful now that it's finally coming out in the UK. How do you feel now you're able to share this around the world? Look, it's important to me because as an Indigenous woman, our stories are all that we have left and it's, it's for us to tell these stories. So we're sharing in a dreaming. We call it our dreaming. You and I are sharing a dreaming right now. We're taking time and we're sharing time and we're in this moment. So my gift to my Australian audience, to my global audience especially the Brits, this is our shared history because you guys had a bit of a, a leg in what, what happened out here. So I am really um, excited and I hope that you all, the audience comes and embraces this story because it's our shared dreaming and our responsibility now to keep this story alive. I say to all the audiences in Australia, Ned Kelly, and I'm sure you guys have heard of him over there, is a bit of an outlaw, but he's up on a pedestal. And I said, look, we need to knock him off and put Molly Johnson up there as the new heroine of Australia. So I'm hoping my international audiences embrace her and help to share this story that's needed to be truth-telling about our history's past and hopefully you know brings about conversation and makes change for the future I love that and I think you're right and I think it's very significant that you've put her name in the title yes. you know the legend of Molly Johnson yeah move over Ned Kelly it's time for the women to take center yes. stage brilliant <laughs> I love it well thank you so much for sharing your dream with us today and um, is there anything else that you're working on that you wanted to flag up absolutely we're also working on the premium limited tv series for Drover's Wife. So I've done my eight outlines. So I've got to hand it in at the end of May because a lot of people said, Leah, what happens to the children? 
And I went, well, funny you should say that. So there's a little girl in the film and her name is Delphi. And in the TV version, it's Delphi's great, 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 great granddaughter. Set in 2020, an incident happens and she has to go back up to the snowy mountains. And while she's up there, her family's history is presented to her and she goes on a bit of a journey. So we flash back to the past as she's working out stuff in the future. So I'm really excited about that. That's brilliant. Well, please hurry up and write it because I can't wait to see it. <laughs> Sounds great. I hope it comes over here. I hope so too. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Leah, for coming on to Girls on Film. Thank you, Anna. My pleasure. That was Leah Purcell. My next and final guest is the New Zealand actor Kerry Fox, who starred in many films including Jane Campion's An Angel at My Table and Danny Boyle's Shallow Grave. I last spoke to Kerry on stage at Latitude Festival, and I'm very pleased to welcome her back to discuss The Drover's Wife, the legend of Molly Johnson. Hello. It's lovely to have you on the podcast always, and we wanted to ask you to talk about The Drover's Wife because I hear that you're a big supporter of this film. Tell me what makes you passionate about this film. Oh, well, you know, something wonderful being written, directed, produced and the lead actress doing it all herself, obviously. That's the main reason that I'm a devoted fan. Um, I'm just astounded by what Leah Purcell has achieved with this, the enormity of the work, because, you know, she started with the play and I read the play and I've never had the chance to see it. I'd love to be able to see it, obviously. Then from that, she adapted the play or stretched the play or pulled it into a beautiful novel. And while that was happening, she was prepping and preparing the screenplay and then she directed this beautiful, moving, passionate, fierce film which pulls from so many different parts of within her her own history her culture her obvious sense of bravery and personality there are many reasons why I'm a fan really it's a really powerful piece of work isn't it if you were talking to a friend and trying to describe it to them and encourage them to go to see it how would you sum it up go see a movie that is going to stop your heart quite a few times because a lot of it's quite shocking and um, upsetting and also be prepared for it to be a female piece of force like in a way that we're not allowed to see very often it's it's a must see everyone has to see it men and women it's a really gripping western isn't it but also the themes in terms of feminism there there are many i mean one of those is about women being self-sufficient in a time when that was quite a challenge i mean what what were the themes that really stood out for you on that level and the kind of real feminist perspective well i think obviously the viciousness of the men and the violence and the aggression i think that really touched me. that portrayal without any apology or just showing it as it is and how the extent and the difficulties women go to to survive that and to manage that, that's really sort of weird. And you don't get to see that on film. Um, and I think that's really good that that is exposed and revealed. I think, obviously, you can't not talk about this film in the context of it being um, she's Aboriginal. And so the force of her culture, the strength of the matriarchy in Aboriginal culture is so respected and powerful. And even though the character herself doesn't know that at the beginning... Leah Purcell, as a writer, I'm trying to work out which part of her might have developed this, but but has brought it to the fore that this is a this is a woman of great strength and ability and ingrained self assuredness and love for her children, the protectiveness. I mean, she's just got so many different aspects of being female within it. It's so hard to pull it apart. <laughs> Definitely. I agree. There's obviously domestic violence is a big theme, but also, yeah, the motherhood um, and, you know, racial and cultural identity. And as you say, the matriarchy. Mm. I found a lot of the insights into um, the Indigenous community really moving, actually, and powerful. It's probably worth saying that even though this film is, as you say, shocking and grim in parts, maybe grim is a bit strong, but it's, you know, upsetting in parts. There is also a lot of time touching relationships that develop throughout the course of the film and things that give you, I think, a sort of glimmer of hope in mm. the supportive Aboriginal community. Yeah, well, I think also because it reveals sort of love, isn't it? It's love across the boundaries, you know, that sort of feeling and, um, and respect between different cultures, different upbringings, different pasts that is shown in marked contrast to the hate and the racism and the vileness that is normally common and has been experienced by so many of the characters. Yeah, it's about marginalised people coming together and 
supporting each other, I suppose, isn't it? Um, which is a pretty mm. timeless message. I mean, sadly, it does feel like a film, despite being set in the past, that is relevant today. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> As an actor and director yourself, Kerry, you, you said you were impressed by the fact that obviously she starred in this, she wrote it, she directed it. Um, what technically really impressed you about this film? <laughs> it's how she got such a great performance out of herself. <laughs> I just find that really remarkable. There's no sort of um, vanity in her work. It's just extremely clever direction of herself and great subtlety. She really knows the screen and what can be portrayed and there are just these wonderful, subtle movements, eye flashes, textures to the performance and the way she's filmed the performance that um, show great skill. You've obviously worked with Jane Campion. Are there elements of this that reminded you of some of her work? I would think, yeah, I think that Jane's influence totally infiltrates most female work in Australia and New Zealand, without doubt. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there any other films this record for you? I've got a couple. I don't know if you've seen them. One of them was the Civil War drama, The Keeping Room. Keeping Room? No, I've never heard of it. I remember Daddy telling a story about a girl and her sister. A girl was going to be killed by a gang. What if all the men killed all the other men? What if it's the end of the world and we the last ones left? Maybe you shouldn't be here. Turn around and get yourself out of here. Don't believe you gotta be. Britt Marling and Hayley Seinfeld, written by Julia Hart. But yeah, a really great feminist Western, and like many great feminist Westerns, just flew under everyone's radar and hardly got reviewed. Um, and then there's a New Zealand film called The Stolen, starring Alice Eve, written by and starring Emily Corcoran. No, I've never even heard of that either. Well, I've another one on to check list. out. Mrs. Lockton? Yes. <gasps> Excuse me, the Fraulein says you're heading to Gold Town. Glad I come along. Dangerous out there, Princess. I make some friends. You gotta need them where to go in. I always knew you were gonna be trouble. I will find my son. You think it would be that son? I'm looking for a woman with this baby. <gasps> Could you help? It's wonderful to see what is perhaps sometimes dismissed as or described as a male genre like westerns being reclaimed, right? Tell me who it was! <laughs> you mentioned the special screening that you did, was it at the Barbican with Leah? What kind of reactions did you have from the audience there? Did you speak to people after the film? Oh, well, there were obviously a lot of Australians in that audience and so they were totally thrilled to be there and see that representation. It's like this huge, ginormous step forward. And obviously most of my friends are hoping that these great steps forward in the culture of Australia, the push against racism, the um, support of First Nations work, writing and directing and filmmaking is really supported. And also, you know, that people love to hear their own history and past and to see that side of Australia and hear that version of life and past and what has led to the Australia that is now, especially given the racial conflicts and difficulties they face, um, people were extremely moved, all those Aussies I spoke to that night. Yeah. Are there any scenes that stick out to you? It's a bit hard with spoilers because there are a lot of dramatic things in this film, mm. but any moments that really stood out that you can share where you just thought, oh my God, this is exceptional filmmaking? Well, there's this beautiful, there's this hair cutting moment, which I remember reading in all the different versions of the book, the script, the play, and then seeing it on the screen. It was just so deeply gorgeous. And even when I think about it now, just, you know, moving in that sort of heartfelt, heart brimming tearful it's about trust and love and letting go saying goodbye also saying hello it's just it, it was so rich I think I think often in films you know hair it has such a representation doesn't it for people it seems to mean so many things that's interesting yeah I mean we, we've talked before a little bit about you know the, the, some of the short films and um, that deal with hair and cultural identity but I feel like we could do a whole special episode yeah on you've it. got Alison's kitchen sink haven't you? hair special could happen <laughs> Gary is there anything else you wanted to share about this film before I ask you what else you're up to at the moment oh well yeah see it in the cinema don't watch it on your telly or your computer and um, take 20 of your best friends. Yes. And particularly take men who um, 
uh, a little bit brusque. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you think they will get out of it? <laughs> well, they might see some different version of how to approach life. Yes. <laughs> it is a thought-provoking film, and I hope also because... It is an exciting Western film. Hopefully it will appeal mm. to lots of different people who will get different well, also, things out of she's it. she's so cool, you know? Yeah. She's such a dude. She is. <laughs> I just, that's the other reason I admire her. <laughs> she's got this great swagger. She really means business, right? <laughs> My Joe be home soon. He's a drover, bringing sheep down from the high country. Your children? What do you know of my children? I noticed the little stretch of beds by the wall, missus. They're none of your business. Yes, boss. He's the boss. I'm just a drover's wife. But cross me and I'll kill you. I'll shoot you where you stand and I'll bury you where you fall. Yes, missus. Thank you, missus. Bury that deep. I think you could have done a very good job in the lead role myself, actually, Kerry. If she hadn't been directing herself, <laughs> I'd have loved to see you do that. What are you up to at the moment? What are you working on? Oh, well, I'm going to Australia to do some tally there, playing a really fun character. I'm probably not allowed to say much about it, but working with people I've been really keen to work with for years. So, And they really want to work with me, so I'm really I'm looking forward to that. And Conversations with Friends is coming out, you know, shortly. 15th of May. Yes, that's going to be on TV, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. And I'm off to Cannes next week, um, and I know you've been to Cannes. What are your highlights and your memories anything that stands out is it crazy as everyone thinks to be on that side of it no, oh it has certainly i've been to some certainly crazy parties there back in the old days when they used to have crazy parties i remember danny boyle and i were at madonna's party clutching hands with each other because we didn't want to get lost you know and at one point we were both pushed aside roughly we guessed we must have been somewhere near Madonna because those were her bodyguards obviously <laughs> shoving us out of the way but also last oh time um, because I was there for Little Joe, which is in competition and Emily won Best Actress there that year and, and standing on the red carpet because I've had a number of films five films in competition in can actually and um, as they said my name obviously it's one in French and I can't speak French to save myself they listed all the films that I've been in and I sort of had never heard that said before. And, and for me, it was just so exciting that that was the number of times I'd been on that screen in competition in Cannes. And I felt so proud of myself. <laughs> and I really, I just had the most wonderful evening because I didn't care anymore. Because I'm old enough to not worry about what you look like or what I look like or who I'm talking to or how it turned. I just, this year, finally... I really enjoyed every minute. Oh, good. It must be a lovely feeling, actually. Yeah, one sense of accomplishment. Um, well, Kerry, thank you so much for coming back on Girls on Film. It's always a treat to have you on. And um, thank you also for your support for The Drover's Wife because it's a film we're right behind as well. Good um, in, yeah. Yeah, really, really glad to hear it. Good one. That was Kerry Fox. The Drover's Wife, The Legend of Molly Johnson, is out in the UK and Irish cinemas on May 13th, 2022. And it's also out in Australia now. You can find out more at modernfilms.com forward slash Drover's Wife. This month, there are a couple of other new releases with great female characters and diverse casting. I'd recommend the sci-fi Everything Everywhere All at Once, starring Michelle Yeoh, and The Innocence, an exceptional Norwegian horror about little girls with extraordinary powers. Girls on Film is an HLA production brought to you by executive producer Hedda Archbold, audio producer Benjamin Cook and our partners for this episode, Modern Films. Thanks also to Shania Pithia. I'm Anna Smith and I was joined by Leah Purcell and Kerry Fox. Thanks for listening. See you soon. children fight for my life i will 